Uh, thanks for coming. So um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the co-authors that couldn't be here, especially uh, the students that collected most of the data and did some of the basic analysis. So uh, Cristian Montero and Juan Carlos Granda from the Escuela Superior Politecnica Litoral, Michael Ecuador worked with the Copleus, and then we said Arellano from DePaul University in Chicago worked with the uh, the, Brightcom, the two species. So um, uh, freshwater <coughs> ecosystems in tropical areas are among the most important and most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth. This is a view of the uh, Santa Rosa River in southwestern Ecuador. So my lab does research on uh, various aspects of the ecology and the evolution of freshwater fishes in western Ecuador. This area is not an area of high diversity. It's relatively low diversity compared to other neotropical streams. But it is an area of high endemism. So there are very neat species there. And for most of these species, we know very little about their ecology and evolution. Um, unfortunately, as is increasingly becoming the case, this is also an area that's under very severe environmental pressure from a, a, a number of human-related causes. So I won't go into the details, but there are a lot of roads, so this is an easily accessible area. And there's a high density of people, and that causes a lot of problems to all of the fauna in the region, including the freshwater fishes. So I'm going to talk to you today about one specific project that we're working on, looking at the influence of artificial impoundments on the morphology of um, a couple of neotropical um, species of freshwater fish. Um, so, but a little bit about dams before I start. So um, we know quite a bit about the potential problems. These aren't necessarily all the problems that always result, but these are some of the problems that can result and have resulted. Um, so we know a lot about the ecological impacts. But when you take a river and then you transform that into this enormous artificial impoundment, that's an example of a major form of habitat transformation. The environment changes very quickly. Uh, it changes in a number of different ways that impact the fauna and the ecosystem, and also can have impact throughout the drainage system. So it's a very big, you know, it's a very big issue. When people, well, so uh, most of you probably know this. This is a, this is a, a figure showing the distribution of dams in some of the major ri river systems on Earth. So there's so many dams in some places, like in North America, you barely see the continent. Uh, this is from internationalrivers.org. This is a similar type of plot, but instead of existing dams, these are dams that either are under construction in yellow or dams that are planned. And so you can see that there's a lot of dams that are potentially coming, especially in areas with, with uh, uh, developing economies uh, like South America. So there's a lot of potentially planned dams uh, along the Andes in Ecuador, Peru, um, Colombia, and also here in, in Brazil. There's a lot of concern about that. Now, when people think about the impacts of impoundments, we usually think about it from an ecological perspective. So we think about changes to the community, changes to the types of species. Some species won't do well, will go locally extinct. Some species will do very well. Uh, so you'll get new species come in. Or we can think about it in terms of changes in abundance as well, so in terms of ecology. But you know, in this room, you should probably know that organisms, you know, there's more than ecology in this. Organisms can respond phenotypically. They can change their morphology, they can change their physiology. They can do that through phenotypic plasticity, changes in patterns of gene expression, the latest environmental variables, or they can evolve. There's this whole field of contemporary evolution that documents changes in allele frequencies related to the main changes in the environment, often caused by humans. So, uh, and there have been studies now, I don't have time to go into it, recent studies working with um, uh, ecosystems in North America documenting evolutionary changes in fishes and impoundments. So there is a precedent. So for this study, we wanted to look at a couple of uh, fishes. 
neotropical uh, large predators, and look at how there, if whether there's a change in body shape um, associated with inhabiting uh, impoundment sites versus inhabiting river sites. Now we focus on two large predators because of the importance that predators tend to have on impacting communities. And we're, we focus, I'm going to focus specifically on body shape because of how important it is in fishes. In aquatic environments, it takes a tend a lot to take a lot of energy to swim through the water. So body form is very strongly correlated with ecology in many cases. So we wanted to know how body form changed. And we also wanted to get a sense of whether the response, there's a re general response in fishes. How much of the response is shared between two different types of fish? And how much of the response is species specific? So those are the objectives. We work with two species. These are both brassy form fish, Coclus microlepis and Brighton algodonos. These are both species that have ranges restricted to, mostly occur in Western Ecuador. Coclus microlepis also occurs in Central America. There's a form with that name. Uh, from Panama, Costa Rica, but they primarily occur in Western Ecuador. Uh, however, the genera are very are very important in South America, so there are species like this in many different rivers in South America. They're Karasiform fishes, um, and they're predators, but bes besides that, they're very different ecologically, so Ophelius is more, it's, uh, more of a sedentary species, it tends to be associated with, with uh, the bottom, not move much. It will wait for prey, and at least Coclus brachylopus waits for relatively large prey items, and then kind of you know strikes. Brighton um, is more of an active swimmer. It will spend its time, quite a bit of time, in the water column, and it can actively pursue uh, prey species. So they're very different species in terms of uh, um, their ecology. Different types of predators. Uh, we collected the fish in uh, several different, in three different basins in Western Ecuador. So we collected them in the Guayas River. Uh, we collected them in the Chona River and in an associated impoundment site. And then we collected them in uh, the Buena Vista River and an impoundment that was close, closely uh, located close by. So three different basins. Uh, and we collect, to in total we analyzed 520 specimens. So we had a good representation of both species. We had more obvious, because that was the initial focus of the study. And we had a decent representation in river versus impoundment sites. So we looked at, uh, we collected body shape data from fresh specimens, which uh, made it easier to, to straighten them. Uh, we analyzed the data using geometric morphometrics, which you, you know all about. Um, we did several analyses. I'm going to talk about two of them. One is a general analysis that includes both species. Uh, we used Mancova to examine whether there was a difference between habitats, and also to get a sense of the relative importance of, of um, the shared and unique responses. And then we also used this, uh, an analysis to look at each species separately. So we used discriminant function analysis uh, to see how the species, each species, was changing, and also to Yes, to, we can, the neat thing about this method is that you can um, generate classification statistics. So you can try to classify them based on to habitats based on their body shape. Okay. So what did we find? Um, so we included in the Mancova, we included size uh, and species. So you know, these aren't particularly interesting. This is related to allometry. This is you know, the evolutionary history of these two very distinct species. Uh, the, the interesting variables are habitat, so whether they were collected in a river site or an impoundment, and then the species by habitat interaction. So habitat, this variable represents the shared response of these two species. This is how across species shape is changing in response to inhabiting either the river or the impoundment site. This is a common response. The interaction, the species by habitat interaction, is the unique response. This is basically the species specific response to the change in body shape. Uh, okay, so what did we find? 
So both sides, there was a significant component of allometry and, uh, and obviously species. So I forgot to mention this, but in terms of the numbers, what really important it matters here in the table is this partial of eta squared. So this is a measure of relative importance. It varies between zero and one. The closer to one, the larger the effect. So species obviously accounts for an enormous amount of the variability in body shape. They're very different species. They're very different in form. So did we find a shared uh, component of variation related to habitat? There was a significant component of variation. The magnitude of the effect wasn't particularly large. It was significant. It's not a large effect, but this, there was a significant shared response. And the interaction was also significant, and it was slightly larger than the shared response. So the unique, the species-specific response was slightly larger. We're going to see that I think it was more important um, than the shared response in this case. So that's the, the analysis across species. We're going to look at this now within each species using the discriminant function analysis. So this is a method that basically tries to find a vector that distinguishes between two groups. So it's going to be very specific to identifying the difference between the groups. And I'm going to look at it uh, for each species in a separate way. So this is for Hopeless. Uh, this is the discriminant function score on the x, plotted against size, just so you get a sense of this is an artifact, this is a size. Uh, and you can see pretty good separation. This is a raw data, so all specimens from the different uh, habitats. So impoundments are clear and the river are, are black. So you can see a pretty decent separation. Uh, we can classify, we can try to classify specimens based on site. So in this case, the method does that. So the fish are either from river or impoundment sites. This is where they were collected. And then the method tries to classify them based on body shape variation into either river or impoundment sites. So in bold, these are correct classifications. So even though the magnitude of the difference isn't large, we can correctly classify on average 76.7% of the fish, over three quarters of the fish that habitat, just based on body shape. And if you look at the means by sample, there's pretty good separation. These are, this is the same data. These are just the sample means. So there's pretty good separation for COVID. Now, how did body shape change? So um, this is, there, the difference isn't very large, so this is exaggerated quite a bit. But the nice thing about morphometrics is you can generate images showing how shape changes. And so uh, this is for hopeless. The outline is the average river fish. The small arrows indicate how you can shape, how you have to change shape to go from a river fish to an impoundment fish. Okay. So how did shape change in Hopeless? The head becomes larger, as you can see by the arrows moving out in impoundment fish. The dorsal fin is moving back. The abdomen is getting larger, so they're chubbier in impoundments. And then the uh, caudal peduncle is generally, the anal fin is moving forward and the caudal peduncle is generally getting shorter. So what you're, what's happening is the head is getting larger and then this back region, region is getting compressed. In Brighton, we can do the same type of analysis. You get very good separation again. The difference between the impoundment and the river fish in Brighton, which was a more active swimmer, was larger, so our classification statistics are better. You can see a pretty good difference between the means. And how did body shape change? The head becomes smaller. The dorsal fin actually sorry about that. The dorsal fin actually moves down and slightly forward. The abdomen gets larger, which is similar to Hopeus, and then the caudal peduncle actually increases in length. So three of these four changes are different from both. These are actually the opposite. So again, it's showing a species-specific response. And our ability to, and this is only exaggerated by five times because the response is great. Okay, to summarize, so species aren't passive players. When humans transform habitats, uh, they can respond. Although there was a significant shared response, Body shape changed largely in a species-specific manner. 
And then our more active swimmer exhibited a greater change in body shape. So I'll just talk about one future direction because that would go long on this. But I'm not advocating for the creation of impoundments, but given that the governments are spending all this money on these mega projects, it seems like a great opportunity to do some research and actually sample these habitats before the impoundments were created. Because potentially, if this is an evolutionary change, if the, which you know, given genetic variation in fish and a large habitat transformation we might expect, you could potentially create very nice time series looking at how shape changes in these populations. Thank you.